Good afternoon, everyone. And, uh, Ellen and I are happy to be back here again. That last song was just such a blessing. They all have been, the worship today has been especially anointed. I want to thank Jason and all the others. And most of all, I thank the Lord. And that song, that last song was just so pointed. Ken, thank you for your testimonial. And I'd like you to just think about the words of that last song. Don't be concerned about what you have to do for the Lord. I think the Lord just wants you to enjoy Him. Just receive His love and enjoy Him. Don't worry about doing things for the Lord. Just receive. I say that as a person who for many years in my Christian life had checklists, literally, of things I needed to do to keep God happy with me. Prayer, check. Bible study, check. Meditation, check. Fasting, check. And the Lord has shown me, son, just relax, enjoy me, and receive my love. My Christian walk today is more enjoyable than it's ever been since I put away all those checklists and I just received the Lord's grace. I think that's more than anything, that's what the Lord wants from us, to receive His love, to receive His grace. Don't be worried about doing things for Him. Receive, receive, receive. And as I do that now, I find that my life is much more enjoyable. My walk in the Lord is a much more of a joyful thing. And without any burden, without any guilt, without any shame. And that's what I believe more than ever, the Lord wants us to all receive. Receive His love. Let Him heal you of all the wounds, of all the things. So today we'll be going through the power of the cross of Christ. And for that we'll be spending just about all of our time in Hebrews chapter 10. And in preparation for this, I reread this book, little booklet from the church. It came out, I think, about. Is there a new version, Dr. Mike, what is it? But if you haven't read it recently, you may be encouraged to go back and read it because a lot of what I'll be saying is really discussed in there. But today we just want to focus on Hebrews chapter 10. Now that we're going through the time of the crucifixion coming up, we have Palm Sunday, I believe next Sunday, with Resurrection Sunday coming up soon. It's good to go back and see truly the power of the resurrection, of the crucifixion of Christ, what it means to us. And as you understand that more and more, take it from me. It will change your life. It will change your life. This past week, Helen and I counseled a, a neighboring couple. And this man was going through a bit of depression, I would say. And we talked to him. And as he talked, I said, Lord, what is the real issue here? What is the real issue here? And the Lord showed me that he felt that God was disappointed with him. And that he had to do things to earn God's approval. So right away I said to him, do you think God is disappointed with you? And he said, yes. I said, well, that's not true. God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. He's pleased with you. He not only loves you, he likes you. And he doesn't want you to carry around this guilt. And this man, 20 years ago, he was a big executive and he was very proud. And he attributed all his success to himself. And then he fell ill. He was sick for five years, lost a lot of weight, lost his, lost his job, I believe, lost his home. He went down to nothing. But do you know, as a result of that, he thought for 20 years, this is God punishing me for my pride. And that was part of his problem. And we explained to him, no, God is not a child abuser. Would you as a loving parent take the little child's hand and put it on a hot stove and say, see, mommy and daddy telling you hot stoves burn. Don't do that. I said, no parent in their right mind would do that. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to good to give good gifts to your children, how much more your father in heaven? So we explained to him, God is not a child abuser. God did not give you that illness to punish you and to teach you a lesson. God did not do that. The enemy came in and had access to you, but that was not the will of your father. And because we share that with him, and we stress with him the love of God, Right before our eyes, that man's countenance changed and he started to brighten. We had dinner with him, was it last night? We had dinner with him last night and his wife testified, test, told us he is a changed man since you spoke to him and really expressed to him how much God truly loves him. His eyes are now awake, he's now alert, his countenance has changed, all because of wrong believing. So today as we go through 
uh, could you go to the next slide, as we go through the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Let the love of God and the light of His truth and His grace touch you and it will change your life. It has changed my life more and more as we've come to understand that. I guess it was only about six years ago that GCI started moving and teaching more about grace. And it's something that initially you understand it mentally, but it takes the Spirit of God working through you to bring it from the head down to the heart into your spirit. And it's been a journey for me and I'm sure it's for you as well. I'm not all the way in my understanding as I should be, but by God's grace I'm further along. So today as we go through, open your heart and see what the Lord is saying about His love and about His grace and about the power of Christ's uh, crucifixion. Verse 1, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it could never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. And this is referring to it specifically the Day of Atonement, when the high priest would slaughter an animal for his own sins, and he would slaughter an animal for the sins of the people. And then for that year, oh, they're covered. Their sins are covered. But they were not made perfect. It had to be repeated year after year after year. Next slide. The word for perfect, pardon my Greek, I believe it's pronounced tela'eo, but I spelled it there for you. And it means to make perfect, to make complete, to carry through completely, to accomplish, to finish, to bring to an end, the second definition, to perfect something, to complete it, to add what is yet wanting in order to render a thing full, B, to be found perfect, number three, to bring to the end, number four, to accomplish, to bring to a close or fulfillment by event. I want to stop there. So every year, Year after year, the priest was killing an animal for his own sins and an animal for the sins of the people. But it never brought things to the completion that God had in mind. It reminded them that they were sinning year after year and they'd be covered for only one year. That's the weakness of the law. And remember, when God's intention was not for them to always have the law because Abraham, the father of the faithful, he lived under a covenant of grace. When the law was instituted, the Lord was showing the people, you cannot obey me no matter how much you try. You need a savior. You need my son. The purpose of the law was to drive people to the recognition that they needed Jesus. They needed a savior. In and of themselves, they could not do it. But they told Moses, whatever the Lord says, we'll do it. They were very arrogant, very prideful. They thought that by themselves, they could do good. They could be good. In other words, they were dependent upon self-effort. So this annual ceremony every year was a reminder to them, no, you cannot keep the law. You'll be covered for another year. So the sacrifices every year did not perfect the people, did not bring them to the state of completion, which was God's heart, which was God's desire. Let's move on to verse 2. If they could or otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. Stop right there. If the sacrifice is truly perfect, the worshippers, the people, should have no more sin consciousness. Let me repeat that. If a sacrifice for sin is applied perfectly and completely as God would have it, the people would have no sin consciousness. They would not be looking at themselves being absorbed about how sinful they are. If the sacrifices had been perfect. But the bulls and goats were not a perfect sacrifice. They just covered the people's sins for one year. And then the next year they had to be repeated. So they were continually reminded that they were not perfect before God's eyes. Could you go to the next slide? Once means once, one time, once for all time, not having to be repeated. 
So it's quite clear that the blood of bulls and goats didn't do the job. Every year they were reminded of how sinful they were. Every year, the, not only the people, but the high priest himself had to kill a goat or lamb to cover his own sins. So it was only good for a year. They were covered for a year. Year by year, year by year, they were reminded of their sinfulness and of their need, eventually, of a Savior. That was the overall lesson Father God wanted them to know. You need a Savior. You cannot, on your own, keep the law. It's supposed to drive them to the need for a Savior. That was really the purpose of the Lord, to show them their need for a Savior, their inability, for the best of them could not keep the law. The Lord showed that the best of them could not do it. Grace, on the other hand, is for the worst of us. Amen? I remember my last message. I love to hear it. Amen. I got accustomed to that. <laughs> Amen means I agree and I receive the truth that you're saying and it will be part of my heart. Amen? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Next slide. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Next slide. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased because they were not complete. They were only temporary and they pointed to the fulfillment, which is Jesus. They were just a shadow. Here is the book and here is the shadow. The book you can grab onto. It's tangible. It's usable. The shadow just points back to the reality. The reality in the Father's heart was always His perfect Son, Jesus, whom the people needed. And the bulls and goats were simply a reminder to them, you are sinful, you cannot keep the law, you need to be covered from year to year. And all this was in preparation for, look, causing them to look forward to the time when the perfect sacrifice would come. And you know, Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. And what I want to point out today is that even now, some of us aren't really receiving all the benefits of Jesus' sacrifice. But let's continue to go through. Then I said, referring to Jesus, Here am I, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O my God. First he said, verse 8, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire. What God wanted was for them to recognize that they could not of themselves keep the law. So the burnt offerings were just a temporary substitute that pointed to the real sacrifice, the real solution, Jesus Christ. Verse 9, then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. He set aside the laws involving the ceremonies and all the washings and all the sacrifices of the bulls and goats to establish a new covenant established in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I just want you to focus on the letters in yellow. Once for all. Once for all time, once for all, and the different translations. And the word once, could go to the next slide, it really means once. It really means once, I just want to put that to you. Once at once, all at once, once for all. Do you get the import of that? In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant days, they were reminded every year of their sins through the blood. Every year. Jesus did it once and for all. What I'm trying to say is that when Jesus died on the cross, his blood was shed once for all time, for all people, for all sins. Past, present, and future sins are all included. It takes a while for that to sink in. And in fact, some people, when they first hear that, they get worried. That will people go crazy when they find out that their future sins are already forgiven? Will they go nuts and start sinning? No! When you understand the love of God and the love of God overwhelms you, the fruit of the Spirit 
pops out in your life. And the last thing you want to do is to disturb or destroy that relationship. The gospel of grace has gotten a bad rap because of those who don't understand it and those who are immature and do things that are silly. But even in this life, if you do things that are wrong, you do accrue certain penalties. If you drive at 150 on the freeway, chances are you'll have an accident, right? And you could kill yourself. So, the fact that people may make mistakes and do stupid things does not negate the fact that Jesus' sacrifice is once and for all time. I say it again, it covers your sins of the past, it covers the sins you're doing today, it covers the sins you haven't done yet. How does that work? In Isaiah 46, 10, you don't have to go there. Isaiah 46, 10, you can write down for future reference. God says, I am the one who declares the end from the beginning and the things that are not yet done, saying, my purpose will stand. So God our Father knows for, by His foreknowledge the things you haven't done yet. And they are already covered by the blood of Jesus. Otherwise, you were saying that if my sins in the future are not covered, Jesus has to die again like a bull. And no, He will not do that again. It was done once and for all time. All past sins, all the sins you've committed today, and the sins you have not yet done are all covered. Once and for all. It has taken me, I think, years to fully, and I don't think I fully understand it yet. So I, I, I see some puzzlement. It has taken me years. I think this book first came out in 2008, Dr. Mike? About 2008, 2009? It's been six years since GCI has on, been on this road of understanding grace more and more. And there's more yet to learn. But this is one basic point, that if you understand this, not more than understand it, if you receive it, if you believe it, if you receive it, it will transform your life. Why? Because then you will be confident. This man we counseled a few days ago, 20 years of his life, he's, now, he's, he's, almost, he's over 60 now, right? See, he's 67. 20 years of this man's life, was spent thinking God is upset with me. He doesn't love me anymore. He's condemned me. He doesn't like me. I have to do things to keep, keep him happy. What do I do, Lord? Pray more? Study more fast? What do I do? 20 years of his life was spent in torment. And as he spoke to us, he said, but, but all these pastors, they told me that God was doing that to teach me a lesson. We said, no! God is a merciful God. He would not torment a child like that. And we told him, believe it. It is true. And we went to the scriptures with him. And the more he realized the love of God, he started straightening up. His, his face changed. And his wife said to us, my husband is a different man. He got out of bed happier. He realizes that God truly loves him. That the sacrifice of Christ covers everything he has done. He doesn't have to do anything but receive and believe. Those of you who are younger than I am, I'm 63. Don't wait until you're in your 60s to receive this. Amen? Receive it. <laughs> and your life will be more fulfilled. I'm so happy that the young people hear this in their 20s. You won't have to go through, like our friend, 20 years of suffering and misery, wondering, okay, is he gonna, hit, is he gonna zap me now? Could you imagine living like that? And I know from people we've talked to, in many churches, people are living like that. They think God is happy with them one day, He's unhappy the next day. So they do things, do things, do things. Do you love me now? Do you love me now? And that's not the point. Jesus' sacrifice is so powerful, it covers every sin for all people, for all time. Past, present, and future. And when you receive that, the last thing you want to do is do something that is wrong. Because the love of God fills you and you just want to, you, the Holy Spirit moves through you and you find the fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, living faith, meekness, temperance coming out of you. Because Jesus did a one and one time perfect work. Next slide. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. 
again and again he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. They just cover them for a year or so, temporarily. Verse 12. But when this priest, Jesus, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 11, verse 13. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Verse 14. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy, or those who are being sanctified, set apart for God's holy use. And this, next slide, next slide. He has made perfect. Next slide, please. Keep going. And this time, this is what Jesus' sacrifice did. It completed, it carried through, it accomplished to the completion, to the full. It brought to an end. Everything that the Father wanted to see, He sees now in those, because of what Jesus has done. With the bulls and goats, God wasn't really satisfied because it was just something temporary that pointed to the Son. But when the Son came and the Father looks, He sees a perfect, completed, finished work. Amen? Amen. And He did it once for all time. Next slide. Being made holy, being sanctified. I was just chatting with Dr. Mike about this. From the time you receive Christ as Savior and Lord, you are declared holy. But in addition, as you walk through your life from day to day, you find that your behavior is changed because the Holy Spirit is living in you. And He leads you to change your behavior. But you don't change your behavior to be holy. You are declared holy. Amen? Amen. You are declared holy. Each one and every one of you who trust in Jesus, you are now holy. Say that. I am holy. I am holy. I am holy. I am holy. Does this seem almost sacrilegious? When I first said that, I said, I am holy. <laughs> I am holy. And another thing you need to realize is, say that to yourself, I am righteous. I am righteous. I say that every day several times. And you know when it's good to say that? When you've done something wrong. Oops. Oh yeah, I am righteous and I am forgiven already. There is no condemnation, Romans 8, 1, no condemnation. So does that mean I want to do the wrong things? No. But what I'm speaking about is that you have that confidence. I can go and I can make mistakes, but I'm not condemned. I am forgiven already. I'm covered by the blood perpetually. So does that mean I want to do wrong things? No, it does not. And another thing that people get confused about they think that unless you confess a sin, it is not forgiven. That is not true. That is not the case. Sins are already forgiven when Jesus went to the cross, past, present, and future. When you sin, you can mention it to the Father, but it's part of relationship. It's like if I'm talking with my wife, Helen, whom I love, and I step on her feet, crunch, I say, oh, I'm sorry, dear. If I did not say I'm sorry, she would still love me, but it would, be, it would not be... A nice thing to have in a relationship. What we have with our Heavenly Father is a relationship. It's not a transaction, it's a relationship. And as part of the relationship, oh Father, I messed up there, but thank you Lord that you love me and I'm forgiven. You don't have to sweat over it. You don't have to fast five days over it. You don't have to whip yourself up, you know, with a chain, you know. At this time of year, some people do that, they get a whip and they whip themselves. That's not necessary. It's already covered, already paid for, fully paid for. The corollary or the opposite is that for those who think that you have to confess every single sin you commit every single time, you go crazy. Because how can you be sure you didn't forget something? Mm. So you trust in the fact that Jesus' blood completely covers you. It's sacrificed once and for all. That covers the past, present, and future. If you stumble, you can say, Father, I, that was a mistake I made there, but I thank you, Lord that I am forgiven by your grace. Thank you, Lord. And you confess because you are forgiven already, not because you have to be forgiven. And if you forget, because I've heard one person say, well, I was walking with the Lord, and it, it's a misinterpretation of 1 John 1, walking in the light of the Lord, and then I sinned, so I'm out of fellowship, I'm in the darkness. I repent, I'm back in the light. I sin, I'm in the darkness. I repent, I'm back in the light. It's like a dance. No! 
Suppose when you sinned and you were in the darkness, you died. What happens? No. When you're saved, truly saved by the Lord, and you receive Him as your Savior and Lord, as you walk through life and you stumble, that has already been covered. You will confess the Father as a matter of your relationship. Father, that was wrong. Help me to avoid this in future. But you confess not to be forgiven. You are already forgiven. Amen? Everybody, am I getting through? I see some blank faces. Am I getting through? You are covered. Not because you do something to earn it, but because of Jesus' sacrifice, which is complete, which is perfect, which separates us from unholy things. So even as a Christian, when you stumble, you do not lose your holiness. You do not lose your righteousness. You are still declared holy. And when you understand that more and more, the guilt, condemnation, and shame leaves. I speak as one who went through years of that. I remember in the past, having done something wrong, well, I guess I'll fast a couple of days first before I go ask for forgiveness. So I fast. Lord, you see me? I'm hungry, see? Aren't you, aren't you impressed, Lord? I'm hungry. Second day, okay, okay. I'm forgiven now. I fasted two days. I can go back. No, no, no. That is not necessary. That is not necessary. I am forgiven because I trust in Jesus and His sacrifice covers me and covers you now, in the past, and in the future. So I no longer have the checklist. I got rid of those. And I advise you as you do that, and you just receive the Lord's love, your life will be freer, less condemnation, less shame, and greater boldness in the Lord. Because, yeah, He really loves me. And it isn't, well, He loves me, He loves me not, He loves me, He loves me not, <laughs> based on what you do. It's not, what, it's not about you, it's about Him. Jesus, the perfect one. In Christ, the Father looks at you, and He sees you as perfect. He sees you as perfect. Because He's not looking at what you are doing, He's looking at what Jesus Christ has done. Jesus kept the law perfectly. He is the perfect one. You are covered and clothed in His righteousness. So when the Father sees you, He sees His perfect, beautiful Son in you. When you stumble, He doesn't, doesn't notice that. He sees His perfect Son in you. I, I reiterate this because it took me a long time to begin to really accept this. So where are we now? Next slide. Keep going. Next slide. Verse 15. The Holy Spirit testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, I will write them in their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless deeds, I will remember no more. And when these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Remember that God is beyond time. We live in time that's progressive. Our Heavenly Father, the triune God, is beyond time. He declares the end from the beginning. And if God knows the sins you haven't yet committed, and He says, I will not take notice of them, I remember them no more. He's not speak, just speaking of the current sins, He's speaking about the future. He's not looking at them because they have been moved out and totally removed and vanished and vanished away, never to be seen because of what Jesus has done. Amen? Amen. 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 Hopefully, as you begin to meditate on this, the Holy Spirit will guide you and give you a freedom and a boldness. This has made me more bold in my Christian life, my Christian walk. More bold. I no longer have to go and wonder whether I'm in this good gracious today or not. I know that I always am. You always are. Even when you mess up, He still loves you. He looks at you as perfect. Remember that Song of Solomon, where Jesus says, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, put on your garments and come along. Christ calling to the church. He sees us as beautiful. He sees us as perfect. He sees us without spot or blemish because of the perfect work that He did on the cross. The work on the cross was perfect. Receive all the benefits of it and don't disqualify yourself. Just remember that the Father is looking at what Jesus did. He's not looking at what you're doing. It's all about Jesus. And those old, old songs, they don't apply. We heard an old song recently. Is he satisfied? Is he satisfied? Is he satisfied with me? Have I done my best? Have I stood the test? Is he satisfied with me? It's not about you. 
Amen? It's about Jesus and what He has done. And remember what we saw in that in the second uh, verse. When there is a full payment, there is no more consciousness of sin. So we should not be sin conscious and examine ourselves. Well, did I sin today? Let it, it's already covered by the blood of Jesus. When we examine ourselves, we look at ourselves, we just become self-condemning, we become ashamed, we become guilty. We are children of the living God who are covered by the blood of Jesus forever. It's about what He has done, not, we, not what we have done. Next slide. Just want to point out, could you go back? That the word remember does mean remember. And since God is beyond time, it means that when God looks at you, even the sins of the future are not in his mind at all. He just totally has removed them because of what Jesus has done. So in other words, you can be totally confident, totally assured of your forgiveness, totally assured of his love, and you can walk without fear. I speak as one who in the past would fast for a week before I thought, okay, I guess now things are fine. Now I can ask what I really want. No, no, no. Those of you who are parents, you have your fridge full of things. Does your child have to come to you? Mommy, Daddy, can I please open the fridge and get a glass of milk, please? Does your child have to come and beg you for what is in the house? No, amen? Similarly, our Heavenly Father has all these things for us. He's saying, take it. Matthew 6, 33, a little sideline, but it's related. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. What does he mean by all these things? He had previously discussed food, clothing, and shelter. The Gentiles worry about all those things. But he said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, they'll be added. Now, fast forward. Jesus, in his sacrifice on the cross, took all our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He that knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. In other words, as we receive Jesus, we receive the gift of righteousness. What you may not have realized is that in addition to receiving the gift of righteousness, in addition to being declared holy, you get everything else. Did you ever realize that? Matthew 6, 2, 3, all these things, your provision, your job, will be given to you because you are righteous. And why are you righteous? Because Jesus gave you his righteousness as a gift. Amen? Amen. This is all part of the work of the cross that we might tend to forget. So we don't have to go working and fasting and doing our checklist to be righteous. We receive righteousness as a gift. And since we have righteousness, we receive everything else, all the additions. Ah, that's part of the package. That's part of the package. You don't have to work extra hard. You don't have to serve extra long hours at church. You don't have to volunteer. You don't have to be a mission. You just have to receive from our Father what He has for you. It's all been paid for by Jesus on the cross. Amen? Amen. Next slide. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, when we know about the love of God and know about the forgiveness and the perfection, the perfection of Jesus' sacrifice, it makes you very, very bold, very confident. I remember being around people when we would pray for somebody who was sick. And we said, Lord, if it's your will, it is the Lord's will to heal. You remember the leper that went to Jesus and said, Lord, if it's your will, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I will be healed. So when you are aware of that, you pray with more confidence. You pray with more confidence. Thank you, Lord, that you have provided all that I need. Thank you that you provide me with a job for my family. Thank you. And by doing that, we are declaring Romans 4.17. God declares the things that are not as though they are. And as we learn to pray like that, thank you, Lord, that I have a job coming. Thank you, Lord, that my family is well. You declare the things that are not as though they are, and then they will manifest. Because you're trusting in what Jesus has already done. What Jesus did on the cross brought us everything we could need in this life and for eternity. It not only covers sin, it covers everything we need. It covers it all. That's the power of the cross. The Father has provided every contingency for every emergency we could possibly have through the cross. It's a key that opens up everything to us. Amen? Amen. 
Next slide. Next slide. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. I referred to that before. When you truly receive what Jesus has done, you should not have any guilt. I know in common world people say, oh, have you no shame? And you should say, no, I'm a Christian. <laughs> that should be our sense. You should have no shame. <laughs> Romans 8, 1, we have no shame or condemnation. Even when we stumble, it's taken care of. Do we abuse it? No, that's the furthest thing from our minds, furthest thing from our hearts, is to abuse the freedom we have. Amen? Amen. Next slide. I'm not sure you can read that. <laughs> but basically it's showing on the right side people who are doing things to keep God happy. They're doing works. And it's the works of the flesh. On this side, this is what I'm more interested in. It shows the stance of a person who has received Jesus and who is confident in what he has in Christ. And those are some of the declarations I'd like you to, to make. The first one is, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Another one to remember that, the fullness of the Godhead dwells in me. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in me. These are declarations. Why is it good to say them? It takes an abstract theological concept and makes it real. When you realize that, yes, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. God does declare me holy. I stumble and I make mistakes, but I am not losing my righteousness. I am still holy when I stumble. I am still holy if I make mistakes and sin. And I don't have to confess my sins in order to be forgiven. I am forgiven because of what Jesus did once and for all. I may say, Father, yes, I did that wrong. That was a mistake. Help me not do that again. But that's not to be forgiven. I am already forgiven. And I do that as part of my relationship with my Father in heaven. Amen? Another one that's good to remember is that I have all things pertaining to life and godliness. I have all things pertaining to life and godliness. These are just a few of the things that we receive as a result of the cross. Next slide, please. This one, I'd like to take a good look at. I, can you read the, the, the script on top? Will someone tell him he's free? This man was in a cage in prison, but the door has been opened. It's unlocked, and he's still inside. We showed this to our friend, the man we counseled last week. We showed this to him last night. You know what he said? He said, that's me until last week when you spoke to me. He said, that was me for 20 years. Locked up in this cage of condemnation, locked up in this cage of guilt, thinking God was angry with me, that he punched me with a disease because I was, this, because I was pr proud. He said, that was me. But thank God, I'm out. I hope that doesn't apply to anyone here. If it does, walk out of the cage. Don't be held in. Jesus Christ has set you free eternally. Amen? Amen. So the door is open. The only thing that's keeping you in is your lack of understanding. And the Holy Spirit wants to give you that understanding that you're fully forgiven, you're fully pardoned, you're declared holy, you're declared righteous. Don't stay in the cage. Step out and walk in the fullness of what God has for you. Final slide. Colossians 1, 19-23. For in God, for God in all His fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through Him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. That means the quote-unquote bad people in the world who are doing bad things, they have been reconciled to God. Let me repeat that. The quote-unquote bad people in the world who are doing bad things, they have already been reconciled to God because of what Jesus did. What needs to happen is that they need to be shown that clarity and they need to receive fully and participate in what God has for them. Amen? Amen.
So they're not condemned. This is the age of grace. And as long as we are in the age of grace, the door is open for them to receive. But they have been reconciled to God already because of what Jesus has done. It's not based upon what they do, it's what Jesus has done. So when we share with people who are in the world, keep that in mind. Jesus has already paid for them. They just need to receive it, to believe it, and accept it. It's like Jesus has a gift for them. We have received it by faith. They also need to receive that free gift. Because Jesus has paid it all already. But they need to receive it. So we don't condemn them. We share with them, God loves you. Jesus has paid the price for all the bad things you've done. Would you receive his love? Would you walk in his love? He does not condemn you. He just wants you to receive his love. Basically, that's the core of the gospel of grace. Receive the love of God. In fact, as, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, minutes 20, be reconciled to God. God considers himself reconciled to us, but the people who have not yet received Jesus as Lord and Savior, we need to exhort them. Be reconciled to God. Come, come to the Father and receive His love. Receive. He just loves you so much. Receive it. He's not condemning you. Just receive it. That's what needs to be done with those who don't yet understand. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. That includes us in the past. You were His enemies, separated from Him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet, verse 23, verse 22, Yet now He has reconciled you to Himself through the death of Christ in His physical body. As a result, He has brought you into His own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before Him without a single fault. Now finally, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you receive when you heard the good news. Our friend that I mentioned, he is very assured of God's love. And when we meet with him, his countenance has changed. He's no longer looking dejected. He is really encouraged and he's just receiving the love of God. And he's a changed man. As you receive, as you love, allow the Lord to just pour his love into you, and as you receive it fully, it will embolden your walk as a Christian. You will have more confidence because you just have that stability. You're on the rock, which is Jesus. He loves me. There's nothing I can do to earn His love. There's nothing I can do to lose His love. I don't have to do things to earn it. He gives it to me freely. My, I simply have to believe and receive and walk in it. That is the power of the cross of Christ. Not like the blood of bulls and goats that had to be repeated every year. The blood of the cross of Christ covers and removes sin, not covers, it removes sins from the past, removes sins from the present, removes all sins from the future. So that we as children of God can walk with boldness and we can share with others, be reconciled to God. He only has love for you. He does not have condemnation for you. So don't receive any message of condemnation. Our friend was so, the saddest thing when he told us, but all these pastors told me, is because God was angry with me and he was punishing me. He said, for 20 years I have gone through this. And he was really angry. And we told him, you have a right to be angry. But now receive the love of God and move on. Don't stay in the anger, move on. Receive God's love and move on. Amen. 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 Amen.